Yeah, and you probably have a lot of obnoxious questions. Um, th this is, I'd uh, like to introduce Secretary uh, Cohen and the Chairman, General John Chalikashvili. They both have opening statements, and then we'll take your questions. Good afternoon. The uh, bombing of Kobar Towers housing complex in Saudi Arabia last year uh, highlighted the threat of terrorism that our military faces around the world and the requirement for effective force protection. And that attack killed 19 airmen and wounded hundreds more. Uh, afterwards, Secretary Perry had asked a retired General Wayne Downing to review the tragedy and to recommend ways to increase force protection. And as a result, we've made significant improvements uh, in security. Secretary Perry also asked the Air Force to examine issues of personal accountability of, for, for force uh, protection at Cobar Tower. Uh, personal accountability is not simply a question of assigning blame. It involves understanding the obligations of leadership, defining command responsibility, and clarifying the high standards of performance that we expect from commanders who are entrusted with the safety of our troops. The Air Force prepared two reports on personal accountability. The first concluded that there was no basis for prosecuting anyone for dereliction of duty under the Uniform Code of Military Justice. Uh, I accept that conclusion. The second report, which examined some issues not resolved by the first study, concluded that no action should be taken against any officer. Uh, I disagree with that conclusion. I found that Brigadier General Terrell Chevalier, the wing commander at the time, did not adequately assess the implications of a possible attack on the perimeter of the Kobar complex. As a result, he did not develop an effective plan for responding to a perimeter attack. And based on this finding, I have concluded that it would not be appropriate to promote Brigadier General Chevalier to the rank of Major General. I asked the Chairman and the Vice Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff to review the Air Force reports, and they both recommended to me that it would not be appropriate to promote uh, Brigadier General Chevalier to the rank of Major General, and I accepted their recommendation. I discussed this matter with President Clinton this morning, and the President accepted my recommendation that Brigadier General Chevalier's name be withdrawn from the promotion list. Brigadier General Chevalier recognized that a car or truck bomb parked on the edge of the Kobar complex posed a serious threat to his personnel. But he did not take adequate account of the implications of this terrorist threat or develop an effective response plan. And as my report explains, there were several security deficiencies, but two of them uh, stood out. First, the Kobar Towers had no effective alarm system to warn of an impending terrorist attack. The evacuation plans for residents in Kobar Tower were inadequate. And second, the command had not developed and tested and trained personnel to uh, evacuation plans, to use these evacuation plans. Uh, all military successes and failures ultimately reflect the effectiveness of the chain of command which shares responsibility for personal safety, for personnel safety. But as uh, Brigadier General Chevalier acknowledged, force protection is first and foremost the responsibility of the commander on the scene. His chain of command kept him apprised of the threat that he faced and offered support on force protection. He never referred any protection problems up the chain of his command. And therefore, I've concluded that no adverse action should be taken against officers in Brigadier General Chevalier's chain of command. Commanders, particularly senior officers, they make uh, complex decisions every single day. And leadership involves assessing risks and balancing competing requirements. Uh, I know that perfection is impossible, and I also know that a zero-defect attitude can make commanders very cautious and timid, jeopardizing success in battle. Uh, service in our armed forces in, is inherently dangerous, and there's no way to avoid all risk. But we do expect high standards of performance for the commanders in the field. A general officer in particular must demonstrate awareness, resourcefulness, and judgment. And Brigadier General Chevalier is a fine officer, who has served his country well during a long career. His primary mission over the skies of southern Iraq, Operation Southern Watch, was well led and well executed. But force protection, an implied task for all commanders, did not get his specific attention with regard to developing adequate defensive measures against a perimeter attack. And it was for this reason that I reached the conclusion detailed in the report that I delivered this morning to President Clinton. Good afternoon. Let me just add that after a careful review of the facts, I too concluded that Brigadier General Chevalier's name should be removed from the promotion list to Major General, and I so recommended to Secretary Cohen, as he just stated. 
Some might say that we must support our operational commanders and not second-guess the decisions they make in the field. This is certainly true, but only up to a point. For it is also true that commanders are responsible for the actions and decisions they make and, where appropriate, they should be held accountable for actions and decisions that fall short of what we can reasonably expect of them. This is not something new or recently fashionable. Indeed, it is the cornerstone of our profession. But, and I want to be very clear on this point, accountability does not mean zero defects. We are human, and we expect there will be some mistakes made at all levels, from senior leaders to the most junior troops. All of us in a military profession know and expect our actions to be judged against the standard of what is reasonable to expect of a person of a given rank and experience. And it is reasonable to expect a senior commander, a general officer, when he is responsible for the safety and security of the young men and women under his command, operating daily under the known threat of terrorist attack, to have a workable evacuation plan. It is reasonable to expect such a senior commander to ensure that there is an effective and dependable means of alerting his people to imminent danger. And certainly it is reasonable to expect a senior commander to make certain that the safety and security procedures at his command are frequently exercised and evaluated to determine their effectiveness. Now, we must avoid the temptation to circle the wagons around one of our senior officers. The appropriate response is to do what we have always done, to assess performance and potential against the standards we expect of a general officer. Promotion, after all, is an affirmation of the President's and the Secretary's continued full confidence in that individual to assume greater responsibility. Therefore, based on my review of the facts in this case, it was my recommendation that Brigadier General Chevalier should not be promoted to Major General. Thank you very much. Before um, we answer your question, I'd like to make uh, one other statement. Uh, when I met with President Clinton this morning, I recommended that he nominate General Michael Ryan to serve as the uh, Chief of Staff of the Air Force. Uh, the President accepted my recommendation, has just announced his intention to nominate General Ryan. Uh, General Ryan is currently uh, the commander of both the U.S. Air Forces in Europe and the Allied Air Forces uh, Central Europe. Uh, and I selected him for three reasons. Uh, number one, he has combat experience and he understands the risks and the pressures of warfare. He flew over 100 missions in uh, Vietnam. Uh, secondly, he served with distinction on the Joint Staff, including a stint as assistant to the current chairman, General Charlie Kashvili. And third, he has operational experience as an Allied commander in Europe. Uh, he led the Allied air operations over Bosnia, the campaign that helped to pave the way for the Dayton talks and the peace accord in, in Bosnia. And as you know, uh, General Ryan comes from an Air Force family. His father was also the Chief of Staff of the Air Force. He is the first son to follow his father as Chief of Staff of a service in the history of the U.S. military. And now we'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Mr. Secretary. Um, your words today seem to indicate that you do not want and do not expect a zero defect officer corps, yet your actions send a very strong message uh, about that issue. And as you know, there's been a lot more controversy than even we know uh, on that issue. Can you uh, explain to us how your actions do not drive people toward the conclusion that they can't have anything wrong in their background? That action, uh, plus the personnel reviews that uh, have been going on with regard to sexual pasts, well, I think it's uh, clear from the report itself. If you look at the analysis uh, that uh, I made of all the reports, uh, I tried to uh, be as fair and balanced as possible, looking uh, not simply with hindsight, but looking uh, with some foresight. And it seems to me that what we have to insist upon is that our commanders take all reasonable measures to protect their troops. Uh, not that they take every conceivable measure, but what is reasonable under the circumstances. And I think if you look at the circumstance where you have a threat area which has been identified as a potential and quite probable uh, source of attack, uh, and that uh, you have uh, men and women who are exposed to that uh, particular danger, that you must take all reasonable precautions. 
If you look at that situation, you find that there, number one, was not an adequate uh, alert system, and I detail that in the report itself. Um, uh, it was hard to activate the siren itself for the so-called giant voice. It had not been tested since 1994. Uh, the, uh, the voice aspect of the giant voice system could not be heard by most of the people on the inside of the building. They would have to go uh, to the windows to uh, even go outside to hear what uh, was being said, exposing them to even potential greater danger. Uh, and that uh, there was no effective means of alerting them to a danger other than what was adopted on an ad hoc basis. Namely, uh, once there was a danger spotted, uh, the only means they had of alerting the people inside that eight-story building was to go from floor to floor knocking on the doors, saying, get out. Not saying where to go, but simply get out. That in itself uh, could have presented a great danger to those involved. So uh, it seems to me that's elemental. If you're in a high threat area, uh, one of the uh, elemental things that you must uh, look for uh, is, number one, uh, a means of alerting uh, your troops to the danger and a means of uh, having trained and tested the system of evacuation to make sure that you know exactly what you're to do under those circumstances uh, where the danger becomes a reality. I think that's not zero Secretary. defect. That's a, a test of uh, reasonableness. Secretary, much has been made of the rivalry among the services, that there was a different approach towards force protection in the Air Force versus, say, General Downing or <coughs> he's approaching the Army. Uh, can you address that at all? Did you find that to be the case? And is there necessary to have a judgment stick uh, uh, for all the services in terms of force protection that, that must or, or was lacking? I think we have to have the same standard for all services. Uh, we are, of course, committed to uh, joint operations. We are moving uh, more and more to uh, a sense of jointness as a result of the Goldwater-Nichols legislation passed some 10 years ago. Uh, it seems to me that we do not have one standard uh, for the uh, Army and one for the uh, Air Force We have, uh, or Navy. We have one standard uh, for all, Marines, uh, everyone included. Uh, if there has been in the past a, a separate uh, standard or a separate approach to force protection, uh, that has to, uh, to come to an end. Uh, I think that uh, General Charlie Kashvili may be in a better position to uh, make a judgment in terms of whether or not uh, we now have a, um, a single standard or whether one service is better prepared to uh, uh, conduct force protection. My own assessment is that, uh, that uh, we need to have one standard and everybody has to understand what force protection means and be trained appropriately and be held accountable uh, under those circumstances. Well, that's the question, did General Schwalier have a standard by which to judge? May I first take, take on the first part of the question? Uh, this is an issue that has, in fact, uh, been brought up by some people after Cobar Tower. I have had a number of discussions with all of our chiefs and other senior leaders, and I don't know of any senior leader from any service who would accept that they should have a different or lower standard from the rest. Uh, force protection and caring and, and worrying about the security of the men and women in charge to you is inherent in command. Every senior leader, regardless what color uniform he wears, wouldn't want it any other way. And that's the one standard that we must have. Did General Chevalier have a single standard? General Chevalier had a single standard. General Chevalier never questioned whether he had a standard or didn't. He recognized his responsibility to provide force protection. He did an awful, awful lot. You, you, you must understand, and I'm sure those of you who have read the reports recognize just how much he did. But that doesn't say that he did everything. And I think what was pointed out by Secretary Cohen and myself is that there are some lapses, uh, in fact, did occur. And those, it is reasonable to expect that a commander of his rank and his experience would not have had those lapses. Secretary, 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 Secretary Cohen, General Downing's report found problems in, in the chain of, up and down the chain of command. Although it singled out General Schwalier, can you explain a little more fully why it is you feel that only General Schwalier should be uh, should should receive this sort of uh, action? Why not anybody else in the chain that was identified in the? Uh, because as report? General Schwalier himself uh, recognized uh, in the various interviews that were conducted, uh, force protection is fundamentally uh, was fundamentally his responsibility. Uh, yes, there are those uh, who are. Um, a superior in the chain of command uh, who can provide advice, uh, can provide uh, resources, but uh, they are not uh, generally in the position to challenge the, uh, the commander on the ground 
in terms of uh, his judgment unless they see something that is clearly uh, wrong with his capabilities. Uh, in this particular case, uh, General Chevalier indicated he had no problems with force protection. He never reported any difficulties either in dealing with the Saudis, uh, any uh, corrective measures he took in terms of trying to work around the issue of that open, uncontrolled access parking lot, uh, and uh, never brought to the attention of his superiors any difficulty. Uh, under those circumstances, uh, it seems to me that um, we uh, put the accountability exactly where it belongs, and that is with the person uh, who is in charge of force protection. You agree with anybody who said he was, that he's being made a scapegoat? You wouldn't agree with that? No, he's not being made a scapegoat. He is being uh, held accountable. And as I tried to point out in uh, my report, uh, I praised him, and I think he's a fine officer. He did outstanding work in many respects. He made a number of improvements, many improvements, following the uh, bombing at OPM Sang. Uh, that is uh, the first wake-up call that, uh, they, that occurred uh, in Saudi Arabia. There was a presumption uh, that terrorists uh, could not or would not operate on Saudi territory, that the kind of uh, protection that uh, the Saudis had, uh, had uh, provided would, uh, would insulate our men and women from any kind of a terrorist attack. OPM Sang that occurred uh, last, uh, a, a, almost a year before um, was a wake-up call, and suddenly it went from a low-threat area to a high-threat area. And a number of precautions and uh, force protection measures were taken at that time. Uh, in this particular case, not enough was done. And I think it was reasonable to expect a commander uh, on the field, in the field, who has responsibility to recognize that if he's got uh, an exposure uh, in an area where there's very little um, uh, distance between uh, a, um, a complex uh, tower holding uh, men and women in his uh, command, that he must take uh, measures which are reasonable to protect their lives. In this particular case, uh, the, the kind of defensive measures that were necessary were not conducted and were not uh, provided, and as a result, uh, we, uh, we saw great damage that was done. Uh, this is not to in any way detract for the fine service he performed, but that essentially, force protection, is his responsibility. It's a team effort, obviously, up the chain of command to provide advice, support, resources, but ultimately, uh, you have to have commanders uh, in the field who uh, also request information, point out difficulties they might be having, or resources that they need so that the chain can then respond. Mr. Secretary, is there a deeper Trump problem? Trump Thomas, Thomas. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Uh, a question uh, you may answer if you like, but it's actually directed to General Shelley. I'll, uh, I'll <laughs> glad that you're <laughs> off the hot seat for a moment. General Shelley, you said in your remarks that uh, we must resist the temptation to circle the wagons. Is that a not so veiled a critique of General Fogelman. And uh, did General Fogelman know of uh, this decision to uh, take this action against uh, General Schwadi before he decided to uh, retire early? Uh, that remark was not at all intended uh, towards uh, uh, General Fogelman. It is rather intended towards the young commanders out in the field. They must understand that we would do our profession no good if we got into the habit of uh, circling the wagons around senior commanders to protect them because they're senior commanders. What we must do is use our best judgment and uh, reasonable standards and hold commanders responsible and accountable to, for those, against those standards. We owe nothing less to those young men and women that we lead and that we often lead into danger. Uh, we must we must provide them commanders who are held to high standards, and then when something goes wrong, we must not be afraid to look at the facts and take appropriate action where things have not gone right. And that, so my remarks are simply, simply directed at all the, those fine young commanders out there who are searching which is the right way to go. Second as far as my second part of the question is concerned, yes, I did discuss my recommendation to the Secretary of Defense prior to the time that uh, General Fogelman announced his retirement. Mr. Secretary, I have a question about the Air Force in general. Uh, we hear of morale problems in the Air Force. We see statistics showing uh, pilots leaving the service for work uh, in, in commercial areas. Is there a deeper problem in the Air Force that the other services are not experiencing at this time, and if so, why? I think there's always a problem uh, when uh, airlines start, commercial airlines begin hiring. Uh, that you'll always see a, uh, a decrease in uh, retention in, in the Air Force. Um, but I think it's a, a temporary situation. We've had these many times in the past. Uh, yes, uh, there may be some uh, a deeper level of uh, discontent in terms of um, 
purse tempo, operation tempo. That's something that we're trying to address. The uh, chairman of the Joint Chiefs has uh, addressed this in many of the, um, the sessions with the other uh, members of the Joint Chiefs. It's something that has been discussed with the, uh, the SENCs, the commanders in chiefs of the various uh, combatant commands. So we're looking at ways in which uh, we can reduce um, purse tempo, operational tempo, and at the same time maintain a high standard and, and, and quality of uh, readiness. And so it's a delicate balance. Uh, but uh, I, I don't think there's anything endemic to the Air Force um, that uh, would separate it from other uh, services other than the fact that you have uh, airlines that are offering very uh, attractive proposals in order to attract some of the best and brightest that we have. If I may follow up, how concerned are you about the morale problems in the Air Force? Uh, I am not concerned about the morale problems uh, in the Air Force. The Air Force, um, I mean, one thing I found in traveling all around the world uh, is wherever I go, uh, morale is high. I just returned from a trip to uh, Eastern and, um, and, and, and Central Europe and visiting our forces. And wherever I've gone, the uh, morale has been sky high. Uh, the people are committed uh, to their, uh, their work, they're professional, they're well-trained, they're, uh, they, uh, they're patriotic, they're dedicated. And frankly, uh, when you get uh, beyond the daily uh, headlines or criticism, uh, it doesn't seem to be uh, affecting them, at least from my, uh, my uh, meetings with them. They are very, uh, I think, uh, they have a very high uh, morale. Uh, can it be better? Uh, well, obviously. Uh, Any time you have a consistent or persistent uh, series of negative stories coming out that's critical not just of the Air Force but the military itself, then that ultimately, if it continues uh, unabated, uh, will have an impact. Um, I think, for example, uh, General Ryan uh, will uh, come to the job. He will follow in the footsteps of General Fogelman, who's been an outstanding uh, officer. He has, uh, he's looked up to by uh, uh, many, if not most, of everyone in the Air Force. I would say all. Uh, an outstanding officer. And I think that uh, uh, people look up to him. They will also look up to uh, General Mike Ryan to inspire them, to lead them, to go through a period of time in which uh, perhaps uh, they, they won't have as many uh, flying missions, won't uh, see as much combat, hopefully. Uh, and that, of course, uh, affects morale itself in terms of what are they doing? Are they simply boring, quote, boring holes in the, uh, in the sky? Uh, so those are issues that we have to deal with in an era uh, in which uh, we're not faced uh, with a, a Soviet Union threat, that we're not uh, uh, engaged in combat, but we are carrying out uh, peacekeeping operations which require uh, some level of uh, continuity and perhaps even boredom in carrying out the missions. But that takes leadership. We've had good leadership in General Fogelman uh, and, uh, and others. And we will have it in uh, General Ryan. Well, you you're you're now. Thank you very much. Can you evaluate uh, reports in the press after the, the Cobar blast that there were negotiations going on between the Air Force, and I believe that's General Chevalier's command, uh, and the Saudis to move that fence, that perimeter, back and away from uh, Cobar, a safer mm -hmm. distance, uh, and that the Saudis were dragging their feet on that. Is that true? And secondly, all the uh, signs and sightings before the blast, all that intelligence did not go up the chain of command at all, is that correct? No. Uh, two factors are involved here. Number one, uh, the uh, Saudis apparently expressed uh, disagreement about moving the perimeter of the fence at the lower levels. It never was raised to, to the level of General Chevalier himself. Uh, rather than uh, taking that up with his counterpart, uh, he decided to, in his own words, to work around it. And so uh, he didn't raise the issue with his own counterpart in the Saudi military, which might have gotten a much higher profile and much uh, greater attention, nor did he raise it as an issue with his own uh, uh, superiors in the chain of command uh, in, uh, in the military. So it didn't reach that level. Uh, subsequent to the blast, uh, apparently the Saudis were in fact willing uh, to move the perimeter of the fence and did so. But prior to that time, it had not, uh, it had not um, been moved and it had not been raised to a very high level of concern. And the decision was made to perhaps compensate for the lack of uh, perimeter distance by having greater Saudi patrols, uh, the number of which I don't think have ever been identified, and to put sentries on top of the, uh, the rooftop of the uh, complex with uh, sniper rifles. And the warnings did not go up the chain. The warnings uh, that were received, in fact, I think General Chevalier Sh uh, was quite aware of. There were a number of uh, 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 activities, some of which were ambiguous. Not all of them could be interpreted as being potential th t uh, terrorist threats. Some were ambiguous. There were others, however, where one truck, by way of example, tried to move one of the Jersey uh, barriers. 
As a result of being apprised of that, the uh, barriers were uh, doubled and they were spiked down. So uh, a number of them did, in fact, come to the level of uh, General Chevalier. What happens to General Chevalier now? Is he forced to retire effectively? Uh, the answer is no. That's a choice uh, that uh, he, um, he will make or can make. Secretary Cohen. Two, two questions. Did you discuss this issue with General Fogelman, <coughs> and did you endeavor to dissuade him from resigning? And the second question, how much of a contributing factor was the political decision to only post people to Dharan on temporary assignment so as to keep the publicly reported numbers down, which meant a constant and completely chaotic rotation of staff officers commanding that thing? Um, I did discuss uh, this matter with General Fogelman on two prior occasions, and I uh, met with him this morning, as a matter of fact. Uh, I did not have occasion to meet with him prior to his announcement that he was going to retire. Uh, and I think that announcement uh, obviously is firm. It's not subject to uh, reconsideration on his part. Uh, he made it very clear that he would like to retire, and he will. Uh, but I did not discuss his retirement prior to my own decision. With respect to the deployment of uh, forces uh, in that region, um, obviously there was uh, some concern on the part of the, uh, the Saudi government that we not have a, a permanent uh, operation of our troops be stationed permanently in that region for the political problem that may generate for the uh, for the Saudi government itself. Uh, whether or not uh, that has contributed to the uh, situation at Kobar is, is another matter, but uh, I, I don't believe there's a causal connection. One can perhaps uh, argue about the, uh, the position as to whether or not a rapid turnover in any way uh, caused that kind of turbulence that you didn't have continuity, but in terms of this particular uh, uh, terrorist act that was directed against the tower, that was something that was, number one, foreseeable, and we believe uh, the potential for minimizing it was there and uh, should have been minimized. Did General Fogelman concur with your conclusions in, in your study? Uh, I mean, if not, what was his reaction? Uh, I would assume the answer was no. <laughs> <laughs> Although foreseeable, the very day that it happened, it, it happened as close as possible probably to a no-notice or nearly no-notice attack. You've mentioned uh, fire alarms and evacuations as two shortfalls. Looking back now, uh, would those have really helped at all, uh, given the very short notice nature of the attack? And then I have a quick follow-up. Uh, the answer is uh, I believe they would have been helpful. Whether or not they would, in fact, have saved all of the lives and the hundreds of people who were injured uh, involved uh, is an open question. Uh, it seems to me, however, where you have a complex which houses that many people uh, in one building uh, and uh, you are so exposed to a potential terrorist attack, they were well, I think, protected for a penetration type of attack. General Chevalier did a, a fine job in erecting the kind of barriers that would prevent a penetrating attack. But if you look at the, uh, the maps, if you look at the photographs, you will find that there was only a perimeter distance of roughly 80 feet, um, less than that between home plate and second base on a baseball field between that fence uh, and the tower. Uh, under those uh, circumstances, uh, at a very minimum, uh, one would say you should have in place an alarm system which would alert people to the danger that would hopefully allow for an expeditious evacuation. Uh, of the people inside and to know where they're going, which is the second part of this, which is very important. Now, there were a number of evacuations in that complex prior to this bomb. They uh, took place because of uh, false alerts, packages that were discovered, uh, but they were never timed. In fact, uh, there was an assumption on the part of the leadership that it would take no more than five minutes to evacuate eight floors, eight stories. Um, the investigators found, however, that it was much closer to 10 to 15 minutes. Uh, and so now you have a situation which um, an alert system for a sarin would have to go from the sentries on top who spotted the truck uh, to call to the, um, the central security center for them to then call uh, the uh, uh, operational center uh, and then for the operational center to contact uh, the commander uh, and then the commander could give the okay to sound the sarin. They were still in the process of start starting trying to sound the siren uh, when the bomb went off, some four minutes. Now, in a four-minute period of time, uh, would it be possible to evacuate um, the eight floors? Possibly. Uh, and I think that um, uh, there was a good possibility of that having been done if it was practiced, if they had been trained, and if they knew where to go. I mean, this is the other aspect to it. It's one thing to say that you're training uh, for a scud attack with a uh, scud coming in, you stay inside. If it's another, a perimeter attack, and, and you're likely to have uh, an explosion on the outside, you would not evacuate and stand outside. 
Uh, those instructions uh, were not clear. They were not understood. Very few, if any, of the people in the building understood that to be the case. And so the only method they had as a last resort under those circumstances was to knock on doors and try to get outside. As it turned out, many of those whose lives were saved were in the uh, stairwell where they had the greatest protection. And so they didn't get outside where they could have been uh, um, uh, injured, killed. Right, so the, the answer is I believe it would have been helpful. We are left in the realm of speculation. Uh, because you cannot prove conclusively, and if you could prove conclusively, that would raise uh, a different issue. I have to also ask, how do you assess today the threat of terrorism against U.S. troops in Saudi Arabia? I think we have to assume that the uh, threat level remains high. Uh, I think that uh, all of our forces in that entire region uh, must be on uh, high alert. Do you agree with General Zinni's statement that they're virtually being targeted? I believe that uh, all of our forces are uh, uh, prime um, uh, targets as such for terrorists, and that, that for that reason we have to take um, uh, extraordinary uh, precautions, all um, reasonable measures that we can take. We, uh, we believe we're, we've increased and enhanced force protection a great deal uh, since COBAR. Uh, it'll never be perfect. We can assume that there will be other attempts to target uh, U.S. personnel in the future. Uh, we hope that won't take place, but we have to assume that that will continue to take place, and uh, we need to do our level best to protect against it. Mr. Secretary, yes. you, you sound very sure today in your, your decision that the evidence was pretty clear. Can you explain to us why the Air Force seems to be on the opposite side of you, <coughs> considering uh, I think one of the words you used was elementary, an elementary step being the alarm system. Why the disconnect? I think you'd have to ask the Air Force rather than me. Uh, what I've tried to do is to go through very systematically and look at uh, General Downing's report. Uh, to examine that in detail, to look at uh, general records report, and then to look at the, uh, the Air Force uh, IG's report. Uh, it was voluminous in terms of uh, the totality of the material. And what I tried to do is to examine it um, in as fair-minded fashion as I could, and not making any rush to judgment, uh, not uh, looking for any uh, scapegoats, but rather to find out whether there should be uh, accountability. And there needs to be accountability. Um, and so my examination of the facts um, led me to a different conclusion than that of the, uh, the Air Force. Uh, and, and frankly, I, I, I found some uh, significant uh, differences in their interpretation of my own. And uh, ultimately, I get uh, the responsibility. I have the responsibility of making the decision, and that's what I did. Can you discuss what kinds of protective steps have been taken to ensure something like this won't happen again? Well, first and foremost, I, let me start by saying that uh, we must not fall into the trap of believing that if we can just build high enough walls and long, far enough uh, separation distances, then we'll all be safe. Uh, we, can, uh, we always have to try our very best, but you have to understand that the terrorist is also watching you and trying his very best to circumvent whatever you do. So this is a continuing process. Uh, in an area where we are in the highest uh, danger, in Saudi Arabia and on the Arabian Peninsula, we have done a, indeed a great deal. We have relocated people to a much safer place than they were before. We've sent back most of the family members uh, to ensure that we reduce the danger to them and to their children. Uh, we have gone back and relooked all of our uh, directives and publications on the subject of force protection and anti-terrorism to make sure that we strengthen uh, those directives and regulations where we need to and uh, uh, correct them where they might have been out of, out of whack. That is, that is essentially done. Uh, we have uh, re-looked completely and revamped completely the training that we provide the troops that we deploy now into the high threat areas, including training that we have instituted up to senior leaders on force protection. Uh, we have uh, worked very hard to institutionalize those changes so that a few months from now, uh, if things were hopefully going better from the force protection and, and the terrorism standpoint, that we wouldn't fall into some kind of a false sense of security. To do that, we have, we have established a new office at my headquarters whose sole purpose it is to, uh, to watch after that. The Secretary of Defense has appointed me as the focal point in DOD for force protection. Uh, we have, uh, have re-looked the whole way that we assess our installations. We have established a, a, a new set of uh, inspections and, and evaluation teams that we send out to evaluate on a common standard 
uh, those installations out there. Uh, every one of our deployment orders, whether that's sending one man over there or a whole unit, addresses the uh, force protection requirements in that particular region and ensures that we address with each deployment the training that is required for those people to be prepared to deal in a, in a uh, in terrorist environment. Uh, the list is really very extensive. And uh, the overall goal, if I can leave you, is to make sure that as quickly as possible, we make American forces the preeminent force in force protection. You know very well that if we are talking about fighter aircraft operations, there's no doubt that the United States is the best. When we're talking about mobile armored warfare, the rest of the world knows where to go and find out how to do that is here. My task is, and my challenge to all of commanders and to all of those staff officers who work with me, is to make the United States, as quickly as possible, the preeminent force in force protection, so that the day will come, hopefully sooner rather than later, where people will come to us and say, how in the world do you do this? We need to learn also how to protect our, our forces and our troops. Will you make the two Air Force reports public? Yes. yes. Uh, we'll end it here. The, the Air Force reports are available in a room down the hall. We have a copy of the Secretary's report, and also there's some um, com comments from the Air Force as well. How All tough of a decision was this? Just time for one more question. How Audience. tough of a decision was this for you? Well, it was, um, it was a difficult decision in the sense that it uh, required me to spend a good deal of time um, uh, reading as much as I could. Uh, trying to make as fair assessment uh, of the uh, the facts uh, as I could and come to a, uh, a decision. Um, obviously, the first uh, four or five months were taken up dealing with that favorite subject of mine, the QDR, which I will not mention any more today, um, but also then uh, dealing with uh, other issues um, that uh, tend to come up on a day-by-day -day basis, including uh, all of the uh, uh, travel, and then trying to coordinate uh, everything with the, the White House. Uh, today was the first day, for example, that I was able to, uh, to meet with the President to go over uh, the, uh, the details of the report itself. So I wanted uh, uh, to have an opportunity, number one, to talk to the President, and uh, that's not always easy to coordinate. But the answer is it's difficult because we're dealing with human beings. And on the one hand, uh, we have a fine officer. Uh, General Chevalier is a fine um, Air Force officer. And yet uh, I have to make the judgment as to whether excess accountability, uh, which um, affects his career. So those are not easy decisions. Uh, but by the same token, uh, we have um, – uh, families that uh, need to uh, also have an accounting and want to know whether or not uh, measures could have been taken which possibly might have uh, reduced the chance uh, that their uh, their uh, sons and daughters uh, could have escaped harm uh, or death. So uh, these, can, these things are, are never easy, uh, and um, I just tried to be as fair-minded as I could, and I came to this uh, judgment and uh, finally uh, issued it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Thank you.